Hey everybody, it's time that we finally get back to Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast. I know at the end of, at this point, probably a dozen videos, I've said that it's coming, it's coming, I promise, but it finally is coming, hooray! So we'll just call it season two and we'll stick with that. So, as I just said, it's been a long time coming and a lot of stuff kind of got in the way and it's been kind of a crazy... Uh, it hasn't been a full year yet, but it's been absolutely insane since when I was legitimately going to start getting back into it. Um, and a lot of that because is where we are sitting right now. So as I assume most people watching or listening to this, um, they follow the YouTube and Instagram and everything else like that with regularly Jay-Z's reptiles that we went and bought. Oh, cool. The reed frogs are croaking. We'll talk about that in a little while. Um, but we went and bought a facility. So, you know, we're located, we were for a long time located in Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm essentially a Denver native. Uh, my partner is essentially a Denver native. We've lived in Denver and suburbs for our entire lives. We've done a lot of traveling, obviously, and we've, we've done a whole lot and, you know, we, we've done a whole lot. We've met a lot of really cool people, but Throughout all of our traveling, we always really liked certain parts of everywhere we went to, you know. We love Colorado as a whole. We like the state. We like everything about it. Um, not necessarily reptile in the reptile community, and I'll get to that again later. But, you know, I've always been something of a desert rat where I really like the desert, but it's not quite me, and I do love the mountains as well. You know, being in Denver, it's where at that higher elevation, but it's not really mountains, but, you know, within... A 30 40 minute car ride you can be in the mountains and it's great it's awesome and where we were we were really centrally located we were like right off a main highway to where it was essentially you know 15 minutes to downtown and then we were right off of like a major highway junction where we could go off and go east south north southeast or northwest all at once like it was all within right there we were right off a of highway and it worked out really well for all of our traveling and everything like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't perfect. We were still like in the middle of a suburb. We still had neighbors that we had contentions with. We still had issues with animal control that I've talked about. Um, not like we were doing anything terrible, but still, you know what it's like to have exotics or reptiles or anything like that and have neighbors that don't seem to understand or don't want to learn or listen or talk. Um, and so, you know, throughout all this, you're always, you know, everyone has, the little real estate page that they're looking through that everyone always looks at. And when we would do all of our travels, either for, you know, for her business, for the reptiles to learn new things, or just taking a break from our very stressful jobs where she is doing what she absolutely loves. She's her own, uh, she runs her own business. She's owned her own business for over 10 years now. She's very successful at it. Um, we're just, just now starting to build this part right here. Um, but it's still very stressful. I had a very stressful um, day job where it shouldn't have been very stressful. It was just kind of a fairly toxic environment, unfortunately, a lot of times to where, you know, we just needed a break. And that's how we started traveling. That's how we ended up meeting a lot of people. And a, a big part of that's actually why we really started again to reptiles. Um, but she always was looking for kind of the perfect house, especially in places that we liked, you know, in Colorado. We always liked Pagosa Springs. Um... We've always liked, for a long time, we kind of liked, you know, south of Denver, like the Castle Rock, Elizabeth area, because it was still fairly close to Denver um, and fairly centrally located in the state. We've always liked the San Luis Valley, um, you know, where like the great uh, sand dunes are and Colorado Gators, obviously, as well as a couple places that we um, we did see in traveling. Like there's a couple places in Pennsylvania that are really nice and some other places along like that. And in the middle of the night, one day she found the what seemed to be the perfect property for us. It had kind of everything we wanted. Obviously it wasn't perfect, nowhere is, but it seemed like it marked off all of the check boxes. You know, it has a huge building for the reptiles. It has a lot of space and acreage for the dogs because we have livestock guarding dogs and they like to roam and we really love them. And it's been really great um, that we'd be able to have a place for them if we wanted to get, you know, goats or breed, um, 
chickens or ducks or things like that on a bigger scale we could even you know produce our own feeders both for ours or heck maybe even down the road to other things or is just you know we decide we really like the chickens or ducks because we've had ducks before um and we really want to get that if we want to get goats or just you know a hobby farm it basically you know it's, it seemed really great um we had two actual separate living properties to where we could have one be like just the reptile house and then us and the other one we could either do like renting for someone that would, which we're still working on that part, but you know, we can rent it out to somebody or we can Airbnb it or something like that. Or, you know, who knows, maybe we'll host the, uh, the central carpet fest or something like that down the road. And we'll have a whole house for, um, stuff to hang out with. And we'll have that and we'll have this huge property to do something or things like that down the road. Um, but it seemed like it was absolutely perfect. And so we had to jump on that um, but there were a couple downsides to it. Number one, it's about three and a half hours southwest of Denver. So it is really far away from kind of everything. Um, arguably the nearest big cities are Durango and Pueblo are the two nearest ones, um, that are the largest ones. There's a couple smaller ones that are closer, like, um, there's a couple smaller, like little mountain towns and stuff. And Pagosa honestly isn't that far now, which is insane. Um, other side of Wolf Creek Pass, if any of the skiers or snowboarders out there, um, really, really far Southwest Colorado, uh, we're not very far from New Mexico in all honesty. So it's really far away. And we found it at the beginning of October. So October in Colorado, that's not great for moving several hundred reptiles that aren't just one kind of reptile. We have all sorts as you've probably seen or heard at this point. So, you know, we kind of had to sit there and think about, okay, well, how are we going to do this? How, what are we going to do for work? Um, what am I going to do for work? Because I am not incredibly successful, um, at least as far as financially goes with the reptiles and everything like that yet. Um, how is she going to balance that? You know, still having a lot of clients, um, establishing new clients down here where we're at. What is this all going to be? But we ended up deciding to actually take the plunge and we made the offer, they accepted it, and we started to move. We closed at the beginning of November on this property. Um, hopefully you can't hear the iguanas banging in the background because that's what they do. Yeah, that was a whole thing for videos uh, up in Denver where you could hear the iguanas like crashing and banging around. Um, but because I decided to reuse the door off of the old iguana cage up there, it's, you know, it's metal and uh, plexiglass with like a little like plastic coated wire front. It was an old aviary for birds. You could hear them just like bang into that. Well, because, you know, prices are going up. I don't have a lot of money and I'm just a tiny, tiny bit handy. Not great. Um, I was able to reutilize that door so you can still hear them hit that when they, even though now they have a huge larger area and multiple places to climb up, they still like to climb up the front of that because they're jerks and they don't like me, I guess. But so we started to move in the beginning of November and there are a couple big issues with that, with moving a lot of, a lot of reptiles in the beginning of November is number one, um, it's cold and it's a really far trip to move. Um, and because of the fact that I have such large racks, because I use larger racks and tubs for my ball pythons and a lot of the snakes just in general, like, you know, the V70 tubs that they usually have for adult ball pythons, mine are 74 quarts. So quite a bit larger than the 40. It's almost double the size of those and they're 10 stack high. So we couldn't just get any truck to do so, nor did we have a good enough amount of, we didn't have a large enough room for a good amount of day. Okay, let me rephrase that. We didn't have a large enough window of good weather and temps to move all of them at once because what that would require would be renting a large, essentially full 18 wheel truck to do the move, load up all of the snakes, get them out of their tubs and racks, bag all of them, move all the racks. Like it would be a three to four day process. And in October, we couldn't do that if it was in June or because even like in the middle of in the middle of summer, it can get a little hot, although it would be easier with the snakes because we can move those in our actual like private vehicles. And then all the cages and enclosures can go in the truck. But we weren't able to do that as well as because it was so far away. The rental cost was astronomical. Like we still have the last few bits of our furniture. Um, and then just the, the two giant tortoises, the Sokata and the leopard tortoise, they're still up in Denver right now. Um, just because I don't have the area for them set up 
to go in, until it gets warmer and it won't fit into my private vehicle. So they're still up there. And then our last, like, you know, the bed and like the huge cabinets and stuff, those are still up in Denver. Um, but everything else has been down here for a little while now. Um, but the cost of that rental truck for that long was going to be several thousand dollars to do all that. So I was doing a lot of the moving um, solo. So I, I finished up my nine to five regular vocation that has been for the last, you know, 15, 16 years. Um, and I've been doing this nonstop, um, as well as hopefully becoming a little bit more present online, as well as in the reptile community. And so what that would mean is, you know, I would get up on the days where I was still working, because I still worked for about a month or so while we were still moving. Um, I would get up first thing in the morning, like three, four o'clock in the morning, and I would take one load of things, mostly animal reptile central related, and I would drive down three and a half, four-ish hours down to where we were, and I would unload it, get set up, and then depending on the day or the projects going on here, because there were a lot of projects that needed to be done first thing, I would unload it and then drive back to Denver to do it again the next day. Um, or if, like, you know, for the projects here, so I would, you know, um, I had to essentially take apart and break down all of the large melamine racks because I couldn't use PVC for those large tubs because it'd be too top heavy and they would fall over just because, you know, it's those tubs individually themselves are probably eight to nine pounds and seven feet in the air. That's, that's really top heavy. You don't want to do that. It's like driving a big, you know, SUV in the wind. So I had to disassemble all the ones that we had in Denver as well as make new ones down here. So where my main priority was the ease and safety of the reptiles. And so my thought, and you know, I made a whole video about doing it as well. And if anyone listening would have had, a, has a better idea, Hey, maybe we can share it and I can blast that and say, Hey, here's a good idea that maybe would have worked too. But my thought was if I can get the racks built and wired and have all of the things lit up, ready to go, I could literally just stack the tubs and enclosure, let's just stack the tubs up and then individually pillowcase and snake bag the, the snakes, put them into another container with heat and around them, with heat packs around them, dry at that temps because there were times where it was, you know, two, three degrees out. And then that way I could immediately get down to the new property, get them into the snake building, and then have tubs, the new tubs ready to roll, where I could just take them out, pop them in, and then slide them into the racks. And that did actually seem to work very well. I lost zero snakes and I seem to have had no health issues with any of the snakes when it came to the moving process and that also went for the tortoises and the lizards that we brought down to. Um, we did have a couple ball pythons that end up having some issues that were probably as a result of either banging into uh, the front of the tubs or something like that but it had absolutely no issues with the actual move itself. Um, and even then now we've already, uh, you know, gone and gone and seek the medical, uh, the reptile vet and we have injections for them and we caught it before anything ever really happened. Um, so something we're to acquire, staying on top of that, you know, watch your animals. That's all I'm really saying. But back to what I was saying, um, that that seemed to work out really well, but it just took much longer than I was originally thinking. I was originally hoping that I would be done moving at least all of the animals and most of the house and everything done by the end of December into January. Well, obviously the time I'm recording this, uh, it's now near the end of March going into April. But now, you know, we've gotten the animals down here. We have someone lined up to get the house so far. Hopefully everything works out for them and everything goes that well. So hooray, we're getting there. Um, but down here, it hasn't all been entirely, you know, um, you know, sun signs and, and roses and everything like that. It's, you know, like I said at the beginning, it wasn't perfect. There were some definitely some things that needed to be done and getting it prepped out. And um, while I'm not the best about, you know, doing like the time lapse recording, building as we go, as some of the other people have done, um, I like the fact, I, I think I showed a decent amount of progression as I went along. So, you know, it was the people who originally, originally had it, it was like a car body shop. And then they sold that to the people who we purchased this property from and the people who owned this shop, one half was used for storage. And then the other half was used for essentially like a kiln pottery workshop. Um, and when they sold the, they sold the property even then faster than we even thought they were going to sell it. So we really had to get right on moving while we still had that time window, which probably helped a little bit with the move. 
um, as far as the reptiles go anyway. They had to get all that out of there. And they left quite a bit, as well as a fair bit of debris and stuff. You know, not their fault, and it was nothing bad or toxic or anything terrible. It was just a lot that needed to be moved, and a lot of it was kind of heavy, too. Um, but they did also leave some really cool stuff, like those huge racks that, um, if you go watch the videos, the huge shelving things that I have, like all of the, the glass cages on, all that was left in there. So that needed to be washed and treated and stained and sealed. The floors needed to be done. The uh, the walls need to be painted and just, you know, a little bit of here and there as well as, you know, managing the mice problem. Because if any of you um, have live in any sort of rural area or are in a place where you're like in a large open field kind of thing, there's mice. And there were mice here, which is to be expected. So, you know, we thought, hey, here's a we have an opportunity to do something to uh, cool with that, too. So as I was moving these things back and forth, I had um, my my new puppy with me, Icarus. He's a Colorado Mountain Dog. Um, and yes, he is earning his name, if anyone is wondering. He is special. Um, he was supposed to be our uh, my new personal emotional therapy dog uh, because I lost mine back at the beginning of 2020. Uh, turns out the same day as January 6th, so that was kind of a really, really bad day. Um, and so we got him essentially as in hopes of number one to be kind of my emotional support um he's not but that's okay as well as he can have a job down here on the five plus acres that we have and in truth he is actually doing a good job of that um he's already alerted us to um, a couple foxes that are outside back with our rabbit and ducks um as well as uh he likes to bark at the herons and the cranes that are in our pond um because we do actually have a pond cool um we have an artisanal well out front and so like our driveway you turn off the road and our driveway is a circle around this big pond because uh, artisanal wells it essentially just keeps on pumping um there is you still require a pump and everything like that but it's kind of this continuous flow and i know i'm doing a terrible job of explaining it but um it's very easy to make a pond and so they had dug a pond to put in there and there's a bunch of goldfish in there um i guess they used to have a bunch of really cool like carp and koi in there uh but the heron cranes ate them all because we have a lot of uh sandhill cranes down here um and icarus likes to bark at them um a lot of hawks too but he's not really he's not a bird dog he doesn't look around it's just like what he can see right in front of him or smell um off we haven't had a whole lot of coyotes yet um but the, you can hear him howling a lot especially this time of year but um, I was bringing him down with me to kind of get used to and establish this as well as in the actual shop we had a cat who was having a lot of issues being in being essentially inside the house she wasn't using the litter box and all things like that so we now have the shop kitty Gemini who is a 14 year old just little tabby cat who is very tiny very skinny we don't know why um, but she's now in the shop and um, other and then after the first uh, two, three weeks she was down here. I've seen one mouse once, um, and that was when the temps were consistently below 10 degrees every morning for like a week straight. And when it gets cold out, everything comes in. And so I saw one mouse and that was it. And I know she's catching them because she throws them up when she eats them. Um, and I've picked that up a little bit, but so that's, it's been really it's been really interesting dealing with that and moving around. And so getting the reptiles established, getting Gemini established, getting Icarus down here and working around with him. I know I just kind of tangent him off on that one. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to do a little catch up of everything that's been happening. Um, and in addition to, you know, getting the building ready and getting the, you know, uh, getting the racks and all the cages and enclosures and everything else ready. The big thing that I was going to be a huge fight and I am still fighting and I will still be figuring out too, because I have yet to hit the other end, is the temps and humidity in this new area. So where we live, it is very cold during the winter and it can get very hot in the summer. We're much higher elevation. We're over 7,000 feet just all the time. And we also don't get a whole lot of precipitation, but I have a well and I can water my grass. So I have a yard, hooray. Um, but so this building, even though, you know, at the old house in Denver, I had the main snake room, which there was a large aquarium and I had a humidifier in the room. Um, the ambient humidity was always around 45 to 50%. And then in the actual tubs and enclosure themselves, I can adjust that much easier and maintain it a lot better and more consistently. And then the other two rooms, like the gecko room, I was able to maintain that between 
the uh, fish tanks in there and the AC units to keep that at a lower temp, at higher humidities, and then the arid room at a higher uh, at a higher ambient temperature and theoretically a lower humidity. It still stayed pretty high in general, um, comparatively. It was still always around like 30-ish percent, still lower than any of the rest of the house. Um, but down here, it is consistently in the high teens and 20s, which is a fight for a bunch of, you know, boas and ball pythons um, and the retic too. We're still figuring that out. She is only shed once since she's down, since she has come down here and uh, she exploded that. If anybody keeps large constrictors, um, it's a little bit more difficult for them to get a nice full shed, especially once they achieve a large size. Um, and she just blew her, uh, she just blew her shed, but it still all came off of her and she's doing fine. But we're, I'm fighting humidity a lot more. Um, you know, I'm having to refill a lot of the water dishes, even in the rack systems, especially in the glass cages, I'm having to redo it. Um, even in the arid desert room, I would have to do it once or twice a week. Um, in addition to just, you know, the regular changing and checking. Here I'm doing it like every other day, it almost seems like on some of them, like the leopard gecko um, and like the sandfish and things. I'm needing to refill those quite often, even more so than I would ever needed to if they were ever to actually go to the bathroom in there. Sorry, I'm just going to grab a drink. It's been a while since I've done this much talking consistently. Apologies. And yes, for anybody watching the video, still drinking Mountain Dew. So, fighting that. And then the temperature has been a big thing. So, it gets very cold here. It's one of the coldest places in the United States on average. Um, a lot of the mornings when I would get up, it would be below zero. Usually in the negative uh, double digits. And... You know, we're a little bit down, we're a little bit, we're much closer, but a little ways from um, Colorado Gators. And they're even a little bit colder than we are, but they have the geothermal. Um, my RT is in the well, it's not quite geothermal. There's a whole definition about that, but mine isn't quite that. But my pond never freezes over and I don't have issues with that. Still wouldn't be enough to put an alligator out there, even if I was legally allowed to do so. Um, it still wouldn't be quite warm enough for me to comfortably do that but I don't have an issue with that. But as far as ambient temperatures in this building, it's been kind of a fight. Um, I do have like a large shop heater because originally, like I said before, um, it was a shop that was meant to be like a detail shop and a body shop for cars. They did a lot of like painting and detailing and stuff. And they have one of those big shop heaters that hangs down from the ceiling that runs off of propane, um, which, you know, if anybody's been out in a little bit more country or rural areas, that's where most people have their gas. We still have electricity off of Excel, which is meh, um, but our heat and gas comes from propane. So we have those big white propane ones. And I actually have one for um, this building and the garage, and I have one for our front building and one for the back building. But um, when using the propane heater, um, there was a downside to that, which is number one, it dried it out terribly and it got the front half of the building very warm and the back half not warm at all. So essentially that will be a, oh no, it's very cold. We don't know what's going on. We need a little bit extra heat. Then I will be using that. So essentially it's just kind of a giant metal um, modern art piece uh, sitting at the front of the shop, unfortunately, just because it's impractical for me to have as many of the animals laid out um, in as large of enclosures as I have and will be continuing to get um, to have that to where it will unevenly distribute heat and humidity in the building. So um, for a lot of the really cold months, we were using, in addition to, um, you know, that's why I have larger heat tape and flex watt on a lot of the racks is because that way it can cover a larger area. So they were kicking on more. That was raising of the ambient tape, uh, temps. Uh, a lot of the colubrids and lizards that were more ambient temps in the arid room now had additional supplemental heat, which is helping raise the ambient temps. And that has been essentially what's been working with that. And so now we finally got a hold of that. It took a few weeks to deal with that. Um, again, no issues with uh, respiratory issues or anything like that. Um, if anything, it helped possibly with breeding. And I'll get to that a little bit down the road. Um, but that has been working out well. But so now, once the weather is going to start to warm up, and especially I'll be able to do more uh, projects around the place, like I can trench out and I can get water into here, because this that's the only thing this building didn't have, is I don't actually have faucets, so I'm still walking buckets back and forth. Um, it's like the same thing if you're, you know, 
if you're using your bathroom to dump water and refill buckets of water, it's the same thing. Only difference is I have to leave the building and go get it from the back house. Um, but I will be getting a new, I have a faucet in here ready to go with a water line. I have a sink. Um, all I need to do is get a faucet and then get all the plumbing for that. And then I have to trench out the water line from the back house because it'd be easier for you. I have, I could easily run an extension of a hose off of just one of the spouts that comes off of my pump house, um, where my main pump for my water is, as well as where the pond lives. Um, but you get a lot of groundwater that way, and so I essentially want to want a water line from one of the buildings where it's actually, you know, reverse osmosis and clean water, and I'm going to run that out to the shop. Won't necessarily be, and then I can work on getting a water heater and everything like that for there, but at least I'll have water in this building. But when that happens, when it gets warmer, I'm going to have to figure out what if it gets too hot. Um, and then dealing with temperatures like that. And it always takes a little while for you to adjust. And that's what um, can cause a lot of issues with your uh, breeding programs, even if your animals are necessarily healthy, or at least we're not worried about them being out of their habitable zones. So we've dealt with the temperatures and humidities, and we have to monitor it more here, but that's all well taken care of. Um, but now we have to think about what are the temps going to do for your breeding and stuff. And so that was honestly my biggest fear when it came to moving all of them down here because October, November is when a lot of people, myself included, are really starting to cool down the reptiles and when you're starting to pair them up. Um, and while the cooling period, which, you know, is beneficial for them and then not eating as often, which, you know, dealing with the move back and forth, I don't have time to feed them as regularly. That also can help to it because, you know, a lot of times when you're breeding most reptiles in general, um, like with colubrids and several species of lizards, they go through periods of brumation. And with uh, ball pythons and more subtropical, more equator animals, um, they still go through a cooling period, excuse me, um, and you back down their food a whole lot. Um, and so that was essentially happening just naturally as a result of the move and me just not having as much time to do that, which let me just tell you this right now, moving this huge collection um, piecemeal as we did was very stressful. Um, because I felt like I was not monitoring them as well as I should have as well. Like I had so many ball pythons that had terrible sheds just because I was just making sure they were okay. And I wasn't monitoring the temperature, uh, not the temperature, the humidity as well as I normally would have if they were all in front of me consistently all the time. But they're, again, they're all still okay. Um, but so moving that they weren't eating as much because obviously I wasn't feeding them um, consistently until they were moved. So I wouldn't feed them for, you know, a week or more prior to them coming down. And then I wouldn't feed them for a week, sometimes more if they were not wanting to eat once they were moved down here and established. So all of that led to hopefully quite a few pairings. Um, we had, I think, clear, I actually have the board right in front of me, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22 pairings, uh, between boas and pythons this season. Um, it seems like all of our uh, first year girls, um, most of them just didn't want anything to do with it, which can happen to a lot of first time girls. They're introduced to a male. Usually when you first introduce them, they won't go the first time. Um, that's where you get a lot of like longer seasons where eventually they'll be like, all right, fine. Or they'll just, you just lose them that season essentially. And then you just try again next time. Um, so it seems like a lot of our first time girls didn't go this year which I was a little bit worried about because I like to give my ball pythons a year and off, a year off. I know a lot of people will just, you know, as soon as they go off, get them back on food and then they have them going again the next year. Um, I have more of like a boa mentality where I like to give them time off or boas will go a year or two, sometimes more in between their litters. I'll do the same thing with ball pythons, especially if I feel that they have not put on as much weight as they had um, their first litter. So I would have a ball python. I've had one ball python lay two times for me, but over the span of five years. So just because I wanted to make sure that there was a little bit more weight on her. So I'd rather have animals laying for a longer time than more consistent uh, clutches slash litters for the boas than uh, other people. So that's why I, everything I do, I like to go bigger and I like to take longer. It's all about sustainability and longevity versus as much as I can consistently as I can. I like to have it more strewn out um, which means that I don't produce as much either. So I was, you know, worried about, oh no, I'm giving up my job and I have to drive so much farther back and forth and gas is just going up. And keeping in mind, this is back, um, you know, 
at the end of last year when uh, gas was really starting to go up and it hadn't quite ramped up the way it certainly has the last few months, uh, last few month or so, uh, month or so. But I was getting really worried about that. I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do. But as it turns out, our two boa pairings and a lot of our older girls, they did seem like they did lock up a lot. I had a, I had like eight out of the 15 um, pairs that I, I paired together lock up immediately. And all but I think two of them as well, consistently over the rest of that, all paired up and locked very well. I still have a couple girls that wanted absolutely nothing to do with the boys, um, which sucks because it was going to be, you know, proving out um, a leopard bell um, to see what all he was. It was going to be to hopefully be producing um, bamboo cinnamon bananas um, from a female banana, which would have been really cool. Um, but such is life. That's how that's how it works. Um, but overall, I think that we will have a okay-ish year. Um, like I said, the, I have one bow that is definitely preggers. I have the, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, our Doom Rules boas are finally doing something, um, and a few other ball pythons that also hopefully will be producing our very first highways, as well as maybe proving out another couple of females that were either like yellow belly gravel, or we just didn't know what it was, so we just want to see what's going on with them, or we had weird babies from them before, so we're going to repeat the pairing, or we're going to change it up a little bit and see what else pops out. So that's kind of what we were going for. This year in general was going to be um, a lot of our first year girls were going to be going this time. Um, the boa that paired up, it's definitely preggers. This was her first season. And a lot of the ball pythons, like I want to say about eight or nine of the, you know, of the ones that we're pairing up, that these were going to be their first season. So it's to be kind of expected. And because, you know, I don't have... Um, I can't, I don't have the sonograph, uh, to sit there and actually check for follicle growth and pair them up as well. Maybe I'll get that down the road. Um, that's been an issue. Uh, I don't have as much success as other people because they can actually monitor the follicles and get the males in when optimal fo uh, follicle size is. So I just kind of keep the males in a lot uh, for a long period of time. Um, and just, you know, make sure that they're not getting too thin and things like that. So that's been going on with the breeding and the move and all that other stuff. And again, you know, it's not perfect. It's been a lot of here and there, you know, figuring out like propane. So we're from the city. We've been city people our entire time. So it was weird figuring out um, the propane stuff. Um, we have a septic system. So we have to, you know, remember, hey, the garbage, we don't have a garbage disposal. So, and even if we did, um, you have to be very careful about all the stuff you put in the septic system because that can... Um, make it so where your septic system has to be serviced more often, and that costs money that we didn't before. Um, the propane cut is a different cost, so we don't have natural gas from Excel, we just have the electricity. Um, but the propane is an entirely separate bill that we have to monitor, um, and you know, we have to stay on top of it because if we run out of propane, then we lose our heat, which did happen twice. We lost heat in the front house where our uh, where the Asian rat snakes and geckos are, and we did not lose any of them. Um, I did lose two fish in my fish tank, unfortunately, which, meh. um, but they were all okay. They're all doing fine as well as I did lose heat in the back house. Um, but you know, we had the space heaters and everything like that for keeping this building all nice and tuned up. So we were always okay, but it's been, you know, it's, it's been a roller coaster of stuff and we're still working on things. Um, you know, but hopefully now that things are starting to kind of settle down as far as the move goes, we're nearing the end with that. We can focus on the front house, which needed a, a lot more work. The back one was essentially move in ready. The front one, you know, we need to do the floors. We need to get a new stove. We need to do some stuff in there. And then we can get all of our animals and all of us out of the back house. So we can, uh, focus on getting that nice and, you know, finished up. And that can be an additional source of income. Um, for us as well, because now we're not dog sitting as much. Um, although it's crazy, people from Denver are still asking us to dog sit their dogs. So, you know, on the times when uh, Becca is up in Denver doing clients or when I'm making runs to and from either for um, doing stuff involving the reptiles or just doing like grocery runs and stuff, um, because like the tack and feed store down here doesn't carry some of the stuff that I need. Or, you know, the dog food is, we still get it from uh, Costco or whatever the heck it is. Um, I'm still up in Denver usually once a week, sometimes twice a week. 
um, will end up be picking up dogs and going back and forth with them. It's crazy. Um, but with that in mind, um, so for me down here, my focus has been a lot more on this, uh, as well as hopefully getting more onto much more dialing in, uh, the husbandry and the care of the animals here. Not to say that I was ever really neglecting any of them, uh, up in Denver, but this kind of gave me an opportunity to say, you know what, I'm really not putting as much energy into some of these animals. So I rehomed a few, like my Timor monitor, um, to someone who much more could appreciate that and are working on things like that. So we slimmed down a little bit of a few species coming down here. And I'm probably going to continue that trend um, to where I'm going to be trying not to get too many more species, as well as I'm definitely not getting any, uh, really any more ball pythons either. Um, because I have such large enclosures, I'm again going to be running out of room uh, for the ball pythons if I eventually, once I get my minimal holdbacks all up to adults and they're consistently producing, I won't have room for more holdbacks and things like that. And because I don't like to give up my uh, my, my little snakeies as often as, mere, as a lot of other people do. So I won't have as much turnover of my older breeders as my new ones are coming in as well until they get too much, much older. Um, so won't be getting a whole lot more ball pythons. But what am I doing down here to hopefully alleviate some of that? Because right now, um, essentially, Becca is the breadwinner and supporting this. And even though bills are kind of all over the place right now because we have two properties that we're still working on, um, we got rid of our like credit card debt and other things like that. But we still have essentially two mortgages and two electricity bills. And we still have a utility water bill. We don't have that here. Um, but we still have that up in Denver that we have to help take care of until probably May um, that we're still dealing with. So money is really tight right now. So what I'm trying to do is I'm really focused on doing this for you guys and getting my name out there for everybody here, um, as well as really trying to go the next step. And that's what I want to talk about right now. I was catching you guys up to all the fun stuff and why it's been so long um, with all the little fun uh, bumps along the road. But so now what I'm really trying to do now that we are essentially down here more often and I can really focus on doing this is I really want to focus more on the animal education because I'm not going to ramp up my breeding. I didn't go and buy a bunch of more breeder animals. I'm not going to be as, you know, more of the animals do get older. I will be having larger um, seasons, hopefully, but I'm not going to be doing a whole lot more breeding. That uh, It's never been my intention to be the number one source of income. While I would love to be able to make animals my career, um, and to be able to support them and myself with that, that's never been the main avenue, but it definitely would helpfully be something to add to that. It's the animal education as well as the outreach and things like that. And so that's really what I was focusing on. So, um, you know, I was really trying to do that back in 2020 and that just derailed with COVID and everything like that. Um, and then I tried to get that rolling again. Um, that's why, you know, we last year we had the podcast. That's why we had over 12 episodes with some really cool people. I got to learn a whole bunch. Um, it actually even opened the doors uh, for a couple opportunities for some of the guests on there that they even heard the show, which is awesome, um, which is great. I wish I could get a little bit more too, but hey, no, that's great. I love it. I love that people were actually able to have other opportunities and things open up for them because somebody heard this podcast, which was amazing. I love that. And that's what I really wanted to focus on. Um, and so because of finding this property and everything getting sidelined, um, like, you know, I really was trying to go to Tinley last year and go meet a lot of like our industry leaders and meet people who do specific breedings and work with species that I don't really have a whole lot of access to here in Colorado. Um, cause it's a ball python pit here. Um, that's what I really want to do, but that got sidelined again, as well as now the traveling won't be um, nearly as much before because I won't have that extra income from my nine to five job. Excuse me. Um, so I'm really focusing more on the education and reaching out to other people. Um, and that's where we're moving on now. So with this podcast, obviously pre-recording, just like last time, getting a bank, a few people, because I have a hard time getting a hold of people because they've never heard of me. And I to completely understand not knowing what is going on with some random guy on the internet that, okay, yeah, he has a YouTube, but a lot of people have him. It's not that many followers. He doesn't really have a whole lot to show, you know, as well as people's time is very important. It's very, 
it means a lot. And so I don't like to, you know, like take away from people's time because they're crazy busy. Um, I'm crazy busy and I'm, this is what I'm trying to do when I'm crazy busy. Um, so I'm trying to get a bank of those stored up right now, as well as I'm now doing a few more educational outreaches stuff. I'm doing more reptile shows, um, which has put me into a bit of a conundrum here in Colorado. Um, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in my next solo podcast after um, something that's going to be coming up really soon. Um, but that's what I'm really trying to focus on with that. So I'm reaching out to people like Viv Tech. They're going to be one of the first guests that are doing really cool, new, interesting stuff for hopefully moving forward with the future of the reptile hobby in general. I want to be trying to reach out to more people who do really cool stuff and hopefully I'll be able to have conversations with them Versus me going on as many of my little very quick, um, but still expensive, especially because of gas and stuff now, uh, trips out there to see them. So hopefully I will be able to get more people on the podcast and things like that that will be able to listen to that I'll be able to share my experience and knowledge with you guys. Um, as well as I've been trying to do more of the wider spread animal videos. Um, so if you guys follow along on the YouTube, I've been doing a lot of like the top five reptiles from around the world which is really cool. And I get to learn um, all the, about, you know, animals that I knew existed, but I get to learn more about them too. And I'm trying to share that with everybody there. Um, but now that's getting out of my range of personal experience and knowledge where I've been trying to keep that fairly tight. So I actually know more what I'm talking about. Um, although that being said, those videos actually take quite a bit of time to do. I'm not just reading one Wikipedia article. I'm reading five, six, seven, as well as for some of them, I'm also reaching out to people who do keep them and I'm repeating information that I am given by people who actually have hands on the animals. And so that's really more also what I'm focusing on too. So going forward into uh, the future for the YouTube, you're going to get a lot more of that, um, of animals that I personally won't have in front of me, unfortunately for the camera. Um, but I'll be doing a lot more animals that hopefully won't be highlighted as often um, with the main and larger YouTube presences that will hopefully still get to show off and talk about a few other types of species that are either commonly kept, uncommonly kept, things that you wouldn't have known about them, or things about them in the wild that hopefully we can try to emulate in captivity as well. Um, and that takes a whole lot of time, unfortunately. Like, it's it takes me a good cup, like, a good part of the day to do one of the top five lists, because like I said, it, it takes quite a bit of time to do that, um, as well as now I'm starting to try to coordinate with other people here locally to do other stuff, um, so which is what I want to talk about moving next. Um, so, da -da -da -da, although more than likely if you're listening to this, you probably already know about it because I'm posting about it fairly often. I'm going to continue to post it. Uh, we're doing our very first educational program at a Show Me Your Reptile show in Loveland, Colorado. So we've done, I've done plenty of reptile talks before, both, you know, on location with people. I will do them in the house, either just to talk about them or to try to convince somebody like, you know, say, hey, I really love snakes, uh, but my partner or whoever it is, or my, my mom or whoever, they don't want the snakes in the house. Can you please talk to us about it? I say, sure. And, you know, after half an hour to an hour or so, they'll be convinced and they'll have a snake going home. And hooray, I get to make a sale too. Or hopefully they'll know and then down the road they'll reach out back to me when I do have little baby snakes running around. They will purchase and that has happened a multitude of times, which is great. Uh, but now I'm, hopefully I'm going to be doing a lot more educational shows, which was my goal to begin with. Is I wanted to be a person who does more educational shows and shares what a lot of other people are doing and sharing knowledge and love and passion for these animals. That's what I was really trying to do. And so now we're actually going to do that. So I reached out to the people who do Show Me Your Snakes. I really like them. They're really cool. They work really well with you. And they honestly want to provide an opportunity for people who do breed them and are in the industry to have a place to put their name out there and, you know, allow other people to learn about reptiles and take home a baby death noodle or whatever we're going to call a ball python. Seriously, there's so many pictures of like the little the little ball python in the ramen cup. It's everywhere now. Um, but we're going to be doing that. I've coordinated with a couple people um, around Colorado that I have met either through Show Me Your Snakes, uh, uh, Show Me Your Snake Expos, as well as other people that I've met just on Facebook or just in the hobby that we will be doing our own little presentation series up at the Show Me Your Snake. So I'm going to be doing several different presentations, you know, showcasing a cool, some cool and unusual snakes that I have. 
um, as well as a good friend of mine. Um, her name is Scout. She said she was okay with that, so that's why I'm going to put it out there. And this is going to come out before the show, so hopefully everybody who hear this is in Colorado and was considering you could at least come out and go check that out. Um, she has some amazing cool snakes. Like I have quite, I have more than she does, but she has a lot more oddities and oddballs and unusual ones and really cool rare and uncommon species. So she has volunteered um, to bring some of her animals there. And, you know, because I know enough to be dangerous, as well as she is actually taking care of them, I can talk about these individual species that a lot of people may not necessarily have seen or heard of and definitely not seen in person, which is going to be really cool. As well as, you know, just, you know, a ball python for dummies, you know, keeping it simple for ball python genetics. Um, we have some arids only. If you guys are listening to that podcast, uh, to a lot of the podcasts or check out the stuff that uh, he does, Arids Only is going to be doing a presentation. Um, an isopod guy uh, named Rubber Ducky Isopods, they're going to be doing something there, um, as well as the Colorado chapter of Park, so Co Park, um, is going to be doing a presentation. So the park is um, kind of the herpetological, ecological survey core. Um, they do a lot of surveys of species and they check a lot of like temperatures and data and they record a lot and they collect a lot of data on the environment, the areas where the animals are found, and they try to find as many animals as they can f during a certain amount of time during different parts of the year of different parts of the area of the ecological systems wherever they are. And here in Colorado, it's Co, so Co, Colorado Park. That's what we have. They're doing a place, uh, they're doing a presentation as well as Colorado Gators. Uh, which any of you guys have watched the videos, you know that I am fairly close with and now um, much closer to them as well. Uh, they will be loaning me an animal um, that after I'm done recording this, doing a, a few more video things later this week, I'll be getting some a little bit more hands-on training um, and a little bit more experience so I can be more confident with people up there um, that I'll be doing a presentation about some crocodilians up there, which will be really, really cool. Because, um, yeah, I've only ever played with alligators, at least hands-on. Um, when Daniel the Nile Crocodile and his girlfriend tried to eat me, uh, I don't necessarily really count that. So I'm going to be doing a little bit more learning and talking with them and learning some more stuff about them. So I think that'll be really cool. We can, you know, talk about some really cool stuff that, you know, people who either have been in the hobby and are really interested, um, people who want to do more than snakes, they can be interested, people who want to learn about isopods, bioactive, and soil systems, they can learn about that, um, as well as people who are interested in ball pythons and they like them worse, but they just want a little bit more of like a visual show of that, um, even more than like YouTube, because I'm sure like like you, like Brian, I'm sure does a very good job of explaining bio, uh, ball python genetics. I mean, that's how we all got interested in it too, right? Um, but an actual hands-on like in-person show, they can get people excited for that. And so that's what we're hopefully going to do as well as we will be reaching and hopefully that will open opportunities for other people maybe might get some more show to the Colorado shows. Um, cause the only other one we really have here in Colorado is Repticon and they certainly don't really do anything like that. Um, I think they have in the past actually, like I think wildfire retics did one at Repticon or that might've been, um, that might not have been Repticon. I don't think that was, that was a different one that, um, is no longer here. Um, but that's what I really want to do is more education versus just, Hey, buy our stuff, which kind of puts me at a bit of a, a conundrum because a lot of people uh here locally they don't want to they've so far the only shows other than Repticon that just booked um have only been in Pueblo and then the one up in Loveland and so being able to reach out and talk to people is difficult when there's not a lot of people vending um and bringing animals to actually have for sale which brings people in to be able to share with that and while I have done I like to think a fair job of talking myself out of sales but educating people um as well as spreading US ARC messages there haven't been as many opportunities to do so and with nearly not as many people. So it's, I don't know what I should do if I should, you know, continue to put in time and energy and money for these smaller shows that are great, that are good for the reptile community, but because they're not big enough, not enough people come. And so not enough people come to the shows. And so do I want to be a part of having animals on the table and for people to come and not to put as much time and energy into educating as for these larger ones, like the Show Me Your Snakes, where more vendors will be there present and where I can have, you know, my very small amount of animals left, um, as well as like merch and educational stuff, I can actually do educational presentations. And so hopefully this will allow future endeavors of other reptile expos um, to do that as well as, hey, maybe a couple people out there will 
uh, reach out to me that way. And so, you know, I can be the guy that I've always said I wanted to be the weird dude with a hat uh, who comes to your library, your school, the Boy Scout troop, the Girl Scout troop, whoever, um, and brings the big yellow snake, although Yang isn't coming with me. So I'm going to have to figure something out for that, another big yellow snake or another big snake. Maybe Cupcake, I don't know. She's uh, She has her days. Um, that when I can actually share and do outreach that way. So that's hopefully what you guys can be looking forward to for me coming up in the future, both with content on YouTube, as well as this podcast and things like that. Sorry, again, it's been a little while since I did this much talking all at once. I can do it, but unfortunately, still get choked up sometimes. Um, with that being said, I have already pre-recorded a couple podcasts with some really cool people. Um, VivTech, obviously, as I mentioned before. Um, but there have been a few technical difficulties. And so right now I want to apologize for that. Um, they have been cleared up. They're the first couple have them, but they're getting better. And I'm still reaching out to more people. Um, and hopefully we're getting a good variety of people, not just ball python breeders, not just crested gecko breeders. Or if they are those, maybe they're doing some different cool stuff or rethinking ways. So we can hear some different diversity of stuff, not just snakes. Um, or snakes that we just haven't really heard of yet. Maybe. Um, I'm really trying to. Maybe I can find someone who works uh, specifically with um, arboreal stuff, like uh, not just green tree pythons or chondros, who does a lot of uh, tree boas and does like Cinzenia, or someone who works with a lot of uncommon pythons like Bismarck rings or Timors or things like that. Um, hopefully I can find stuff like that. Or maybe one of these days I'll get a really cool monitor person on um, and we can talk about monitor stuff, which would be really, really cool. Um, but with all of that being said... Uh, we are back. We never really went anywhere. We just kind of took a bit of a hiatus. Um, so stay tuned for more cool stuff. And also, you will probably get sick of me hearing this. You've probably heard, gotten sick of hearing other people say this too. Um, and fair warning, I'll probably be saying this at the beginning of a lot of these. Um, please support US ARC. Um, that's the United, uh, the United States Association of Reptile Keepers. Uh, you know, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum although it's not much of a spectrum anymore um regardless of where you sit um politicians are essentially bought and paid for that's the system we have regardless of who it is they're all bought and paid for they all have interest groups influencing their decisions and what they do um and right now a one with a whole lot of money are animal rights groups i know animal rights sounds great i know it does i like i like the idea of that but what their goal is to have no more animals in captivity. Um, that includes dogs and cats. That includes livestock. That includes zoos. That includes conservation programs. No more animals in captivity, period. So they have a lot easier time starting with the animals that a lot of people don't like, snakes, and then getting groundwork and footwork to being able to add more down the road. That's their goal. They're looking way out there. That's why they're pushing so hard right now. Because reptiles are getting very popular as pets. Bearded dragons are now the most popular pet reptile in the world. There is uh, something close to like one in ten. One in ten houses have a reptile in them. And probably most of those it's a bearded dragon. And if not a bearded dragon it's probably a ball python. So they're really pushing hard now to get legislation put in place to make it easier for them to get them out of our lives and out of our hands now before they have a harder time doing it before it'll almost be like fighting them for a cat or dog um so us arc they are the ones that are going to bat for us and they have gone to bat for us multiple times they've done it here in colorado they've done it federally before um but federally they're trying to take our our ability to take these away and us arc has gone to bat for us before and won so this isn't just a group that's sitting there and saying, yes, yes, please support, and they take our money. They really have done stuff for us, and they are doing stuff for us right now. So please, if you can, go to US Arc's website. They make it very easy to do a lot of stuff to reach out to politicians, because if they have enough people saying, here are all these people, here are all these paying people, money matters to them more than a whole lot of voices. It's sad, and it sucks to be sad, but that's the, that's the truth. So... If you can, you know, for less than the cost of a cup of coffee a day, you know, sign up for a bronze membership at US Arc, um, follow their prompts, reach out to people, just click and share their stuff. Please, please, please do that. Otherwise, we're going to lose our ability to have these animals. We're going to lose our ability to transport them. And I will lose my ability to share that with you 
And if I can't share that to people, how can I expect people to care about it? If people don't know about a thing, they can't be expected to care about a thing. And that's what matters right now. It's, it's, it's not just, I want to be able to keep my reticulated Python. It's so much more than that. And it's a huge snowball. And that's what they're fighting for. And that's what we really need. Their, that's what they need our support and help with. So that's my soapbox for this one. You'll be hearing more down the road. I am very certain of that. Please stay tuned for more stuff. I very look forward to uh, sharing these podcasts with you guys. And again, I do apologize for a few of those technical difficulties on the first couple podcasts. Hope everyone is having a great day, night, weekend, whenever you're listening or watching this. And we will catch you next time.